yeah, hello from my end. That's quite big as a screen. So let me start by just saying I'm incredibly proud of um, being in Munich and being on a stage like that, particularly because it's not in Berlin, where normally the whole startup discussion runs. So I'm very thankful to the guys from Bits and Pretzels that really pulled that also a little bit to the south of Germany, which obviously helps us with the business that is just situated here in terms of talent and in terms of business discussions. So the title of the presentation is Forever Young, so that's not about me. I would like to be that as well, but that doesn't necessarily work. But it's a little bit about the next phase, right? When you talk about startups, it's always about the start. How do you go into the market? How do you start to initially grow? And maybe then how do you um, sell that business on or how do you, do you, do you stick that, uh, to that business? But if you wake up after like 15 years of um, being in the market, and you wake up with a thousand employees here in Munich and 27 million users um, using you actually basing on this question that we've just heard about, do you have a payback card? So you would need 227 nights at the Oktoberfest to serve all your customers if they, if they sit there and get their beer. Um, then you come into a, into a second phase, into another phase of problems, and you, you need to maintain something that you had in the beginning and in the start of your business. But on top of that, you need to, to, to add something dealing with just the sheer size of what you have achieved. And that's a little bit the journey I wanted to take you uh, on today. So as I said, 227 times um, the Oktoberfest. I don't know whether you have been, but then you can a little bit imagine the, the magnitude of what that means in terms of user engagement and customer relation. So obviously for us it also started 15 years ago in one single room, so that's the Polaroid of this one room at the airport here in Munich where Payback was founded and started. And that's I think comparable to some of the startup discussions we now have by far not as digital as it now is, right? So startup at that time didn't mean that everything is digital, it meant um, that you started with something very physical, a very old-fashioned, um, but yet very well-working plastic card that still looks similar, a little bit more modern, but still looks similar. On top of that come some employees. That's my managing director colleague, who will also be a table captain tomorrow, Bernard Brugger. Uh, now he's filling his shirt and suit a little bit better uh, than, than he used to do 15 years ago. So that's, that's how it starts. It starts with people, it starts with an idea. It wasn't necessarily digital. Um, that is the first website we had. So we were very proud of an AOL logo just at the bottom of the page. I'm personally quite sad that it doesn't feature this Netscape 2.0 button on GIF that is rotating or something like that. So obviously website was there, that, but that wasn't the essence of what we were doing. And it was particularly not what users were expecting when you started a program like, like Payback, which essentially is a loyalty program giving you back cards, uh, points uh, when you show your card and um, allowing you for marketing, for targeted marketing um, afterwards to those, to those users. So we grew and grew into a bigger building. Um, I know this journey, I used to work at eBay before and there with PayPal we started at the bottom and then slowly climbing up the stairs and getting more and more and more people working. Here's a little bit the same, so we started in the building and you could joke, um, the more floors that uh, Yahoo was giving back to the landlord, the more floors we rented at the same time. So it grew bigger and bigger and bigger and um, now it's almost the whole building um, covered and stuffed full of um, payback employees. So when, when, when this is the, the, the process you are in, um, then you're facing what, what I said at the beginning, um, you need to develop your product. So the product from the beginning was plastic card, came with some coupons that you could show on top saying like I get three times the points for this product and 10 times the points for that product. So that's, that's obviously what we did for quite some, for quite some time. Um, and then when you add a very, very simple ingredient to that, which is the mobile device, then suddenly the whole world changes, and it did already for us. Because instead of carrying a plastic card, you're able to identify yourself with the mobile phone. But even more important, the, the coupons that normally you have at home with a magnet at your, at your fridge or that your wife has put out for you to use or that you put out for your wife to use, they're never where you need them. 
so they're most likely not in the wallet together with a card when you're shopping. So if you use the mobile phone for that, and it's a very, very simple change, then immediately you have a 100% usage rate of, of these additional coupons. And if you have a 100% usage rate of, of additional coupons, you can steer customers better um, into, into certain products. You can educate them better on the certain benefits they get and everything. So just this one device, doing exactly the same stuff that you did before completely renovates your business and that goes back to the first sentence of we need to innovate in that direction. Obviously we did and, and that's already there. But at the same time, when you go through this evolution on how, ha how do you need to, to, to develop your product, how does your product change, um, I think the bigger change is even inside, right? So we have obviously quite some smart MBAs in our company and we used to have them for 15 years so that's Michael Schiller he looks exactly how you would imagine an MBA to look like and they were the kind of profiles that that, that we were hiring over the last 15 years if we now look at what we are looking for and what we desperately need with a team of more than what is it, more than a hundred people just for the German IT business alone in tech and product um, then it's more a scrum master that we need they're different it's not a white shirt, it's a, it's a polo shirt, it's a Cisco item on them. They look different, they are different, they need different environments to work in. And we need to deal with them differently. So it's, a, it's getting a richer culture of more different people and different skill set because we are in a very lucky situation. We've got a lot of businesses, um, particularly also in, in um, publishing, where the standard business model is declining. So to a certain degree, you need to fire the guys in the white shirts and do something with the guys in the polos. Um, that's not the case for us. So we are two digit, uh, growing by two digits in, in, in our classic business. So we need all of them. But in addition, we need much more tech uh, competency, much more tech talent also within the company. So the company has to be attractive to them. And that's what I want, meant with second phase of, of your growth. You need to behave differently. You need to do different stuff. You need to attract different people. When they come to us, we need to still create this, this feeling of a startup in terms of not starting at Siemens with a thousand others at the same time. So every new employee at, at Payback gets a Schule tutor. I don't know what the translation of that would be. Um, getting their first day, getting some personal feel of how we want uh, cohesive teams also to work with each other. And if you then look at the, the environment also, I mean, if you have like 10, 15 people in one room, it's very easy to have a cohesive environment. Maybe it's a little bit annoying as well, but it's very easy. If you come to a thousand people in a, in a building at different corners that don't see each other, you have to do something about how they work with each other and how they spend time even on the campus and together with you. So we did a lot to create opportunities and that's not our quest of being like Google and hip and cool or anything. It's really the quest of um, establishing a working environment um, that helps people to enjoy working there, to talk about you in a very, in a very positive fashion, and to, 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 to wanting actually to sign the contract once they had the interview with you. So we created a Spielzimmer, which is a um, playroom. It's not what you think. Um, so it's really about just games and computer games and everything. Um, it is where you can have meetings. It is where you can a little bit hang out with your colleagues, where you get to know other colleagues, not just for meetings, so that helps a lot. Then, obviously, the whole environment of how do you set up just people sitting together in, a, in, in an office, it gets important. It's a very important decision, is it an open plan office, it is something smaller, how do groups talk to each other, how do you not lose communication uh, and, and create loose ends, so that got important. How do you even create all hands, how do you create, do you create events? when suddenly your size goes to a, to a point where you can't do that on your premises like you used to do before, or where you can't go to a restaurant where everybody fits in. So all of that is either something where you lose your startup culture and it gets anonymous, or you need to do a lot and invent a lot um, to, to, to create an environment that maintains the positive aspects of such an innovative culture that we luckily had at the beginning and were able to maintain. You need to stick out, you need to do stuff, that doesn't let you look like, oh, they are doing it since 15 years and still the same boring stuff. So when we went to the Demexco um, this year, it was again for us a presentation of like 
obviously we do a lot in classic, but we do have 40% of our revenues in digital, and we do something that is comparable to the mom and pop shop, to the um, Auntie Emma, Tante Emma 2.0, who also knew what you're doing, and the targeting that we do is just something on a much bigger scale um, than the shop where the clerk knows you and is also able to recommend certain products to you. So you need to stick out. Um, and you need to always ask yourself in this journey, what do I need to do to my product? What do I need to do to my environment and my people? What do I need to do in my positioning um, also towards the market, towards B2B or B2C ends of the market um, to, to create and maintain the competitive edge that I think we all connect to the world of startups. So that was obviously also our idea when we started having these, um, these meetings, quite a standard thing for a startup, but bigger companies normally don't do that. Product, uh, love, meetups, sit together, what is already going right, right, what is not going right, identify that in groups, work on it, and always ask yourself the question, can we get better at something? Or do we just stick to what we've done for 15 years and then get boring and slightly disappear like the AOLs that we've seen a few slides back? Um, rocking and socking is, is the point of it. We're also experimenting with um, something we call PKT. It's our way of dealing with the idea of accelerators um, we want to pull entrepreneurs into the company, working as intrapreneurs um, on topics that we can't always tackle with the organizations we already have. We say, like, this is the idea, this is a business field that could be developed. We don't have the time for it or the focus, because if you don't do it single-mindedly, it normally doesn't work. Um, so we set up a certain construction where it's actually possible for an entrepreneur to enter into the company, get a certain... Um, product, get a certain project, and get an idea um, to develop to, a, to, to another stage, almost in the shadow and under the umbrella of a bigger company already, already running. So if anybody in here is interested in that, just shoot us a mail at pkt at payback.net, and we can see whether there's a, a project that you can take further um, already with a lot of stuff and groundwork done, rather than fully starting from scratch. We learned about mission, mission statements before, so um, I kept it in German so that you don't see that uh, a certain word is missing um, that we learned is the reason for, for accelerated growth. However, I, I still think a mission statement is also something just in the word that comes with getting bigger. With getting a bigger company, normally they get more time, they get more attention. The risk is always that you have your mission statement formulated in PowerPoint or something else then it goes into the drawer. So I think it's a bigger problem of being in the drawer than it being in PowerPoint. Um, because it's just getting created together with an agency with a lot of money, and then nobody does something. It's just a compromise of words that people have filtered into your mission statement. So we really try to live ours. So it's throughout the whole company, you see it, we really try to pull it into the meetings to always ask yourself, is that according to what we want to achieve? Uh, which is to actually make interaction every interaction a rewarding experience. That's the base of a loyalty program, and with some, as we call it, imperatives around it, how we want to achieve that in the process. So essentially important um, if it's done right and not just a generic, a generic agency work um, landing and ending up in drawers. And then the last one, I think, is also typical for bigger companies. You're, I don't know who of you knows this video of a guy pouring sand into a big glass and saying, like, this is the sand of everyday work. And if you then come up with additional innovative priorities, how can you push those into the sand you can't? Um, the, the only chance is actually placing them in the big bowl before and then pouring the sand on top. Meaning you have to be very clear about um, what needs to come on top. Because otherwise, just in a bigger company, every, you, your day-to-day -day work just eats you up. You, you, you're leaving the phase of being innovative and creating big things and big rocks, and just entering into a phase of repairing and maintaining what you've done a couple of years back. But if you do that for a certain period of time, you're not being, and or you're not going to be in the market for much longer. So you need to push in your big ones um, quite at the, uh, at the beginning of a year, for example, and say like, these are the five, ten things we really want to do, and then uh, you can be sure that the sand of everyday work and projects comes on top anyway. So. In a nutshell, the, the, what, what I wanted to bring, actually, is um, 
phase two of successful startups isn't necessarily just selling them to somebody else. I think phase two is to a certain degree um, creating a sustainable business that stays there for longer than 10, 15 or 20 years. That constantly grows and that's only possible by working on your positioning, what do you really want to achieve, extremely focusing on your talent, how should it feel like working in this company because otherwise it's going to get slow and boring and not necessarily working and obviously um, technically innovate to a degree that the user always gets more benefit out of, out of using you and your products. So if that's successfully done, then hopefully the future is bright. We hope that ours is. At least it looks so at the moment. And thank you very much for the time. Never seen one of those, did you? Mm. Mm. Take it. I don't know what it is, to be honest. You put money in. It's a happy device. <laughs> it makes you happy. Thank well, you. Well, people, is there any questions to Dominic? Please uh, seek out one of our microphones. If, okay, I don't see anybody, somebody here. No? Okay. Dominic, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. And hope to see you next year again. Thank you. Thanks very much. Dominic, Dominic. <laughs>